information. Um, first and foremost, I want to let you all, all of you, everybody, know that we in the Palm Heights Neighborhood Association took a vote after a spirited discussion last month, and we are unanimously and emphatically opposed to the uh, scheme of having a parking garage and uh, a tram to take people in and out of the park. No. We, we feel very strongly about it. We won't just stop at passing resolutions. We talked to our councilwoman and we will do whatever else is in our power to, to stop that thing happening. Uh, let me just say that I've been reading Jane Jacobs' uh, The Death and Life of American Cities and her whole perspective is that cities are organisms, that you don't just impose some kind of a plan. I know that it's, in, it's attractive to look at Brackenridge Park and say, ooh, green space. Let's make it really, really green. I know the old environmentalists will be for that. But the thing is, Brackenridge Park has been used for a very long time, longer than I've been around, uh, for, for, by people who love it, by families, and not just on Easter. You know, they go out on Sunday, Sunday afternoons, they go out uh, and, and enjoy it. He, office workers go and eat their lunch out there. It's a, it's a wonderful resource. It is not a zoo. Yes, there's a zoo in the middle of it, but don't, don't confuse this with some kind of a, uh, a zoo where, as the gentleman said, we as invasive species come in and visit it. No, the Brackenridge Park is a living, breathing part of our community. And I hope that, the, that you all, planners, will, under, will take that into consideration and not impose a sort of grand idea on it, but will work everything that you do into what the people are, are already doing so that you don't uproot everything and, and make people do what they don't feel like doing. It's our part. It's our part. Now, that being said, there's a lot of good ideas in this plan, and, and we really do... Uh, we did not address that in my community meeting. It was just the, the idea that they were going to suddenly wall us off from the park and make us get into little trams like it was Disney World or whatever and, and go around to our little picnic tables. Uh, and that, that's really unacceptable. It's not, a, it's not in harmony with the way things are being used. If you want impervious cover, that's easy. It's easy to make parking lots into impervious cover, I, I'm sorry, into impervious cover, uh, you know, covers by just, uh, you know, to tear up the, the asphalt, of course. You can even do that with the roads, and you can make bike, bike paths and all kinds of other stuff. But anyway, I think you get the idea of where we are as a, an organization and where I am personally. Thank you. Thank you. Might be more. I might be more. I've Spanish lived in Segura. San Antonio. I'm fourth generation San Antonio. I've been here all my life and I grew up in Brackenridge Park, learned how to ride a horse there. To this day, I walk every day there. I walk two miles a day. You say you want to preserve, protect, and restore the park. I say if you're worried about pavement, impervious cover, lay down, as he said, pavers or porous concrete, or you can even grass and then mow the streets. <laughs> I say you have to allow the owners of the park that are all sitting in this room, and the citizens of the city own San Antonio. They own the park. And I say you can't say to the people that own a piece of property that they do not have complete and free access any way, any time that they want to go into their park, including accessing back and forth through Hildebrand into the, in and out of the park. I don't think you should restrict any access at all in the park, and I don't think there should be parking garages. There's lots of free parking. There's a thousand, I went and counted them, there's a thousand spaces of parking just up the hill from the zoo where people are parking all over the place. And 600 of those thousand spaces are shaded by the freeway overhead. I can't understand why there needs to be any parking garages, certainly not trams. You need to involve the users of the park in all of your plans. These people and the people that use the park are not informed. I have handed out 200 flyers since April as I walk through the park every day, and yet once, not once, have ever met a person 
who already knew what's going on with these plans. You guys are not informing the people. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, I think the golf course uh, lease expires next year. I think it should be taken back to the, by the people. You have four and five generations of golfers that don't get to play golf there anymore because you've made it too expensive. The trees have been butchered. The river banks denuded and they are eroding. They dump fertilizer and chemicals into the river on a regular basis. And I guess what I'm wondering, is it Parks and Recreation who oversees what those people are doing to the golf course vegetation? Who oversees them, what they're doing? Yes, that is the charge of the city and Parks and Recreation. And so you're, you're letting them butcher the trees and yet you're saying you want to do invasive species removal. Well, why aren't you doing it? And why aren't you taking care of the vegetation at the golf course? And why aren't the four and five generations of Mexican people that used to play golf there all the time not there anymore? And how come every time I go walking my dogs all over the golf courses because there's no golfers there? I don't know, it needs to be taken back. If you want a green space, take back the golf course next year. <laughs> and there's plenty of grand lawn there. Or take up the uh, driving range, and I'm going to finish so you can put the timer in your pocket. I think you should, I think you should, I think you've spent $250,000 on advisors and landscape architects, and I'm sure that's part of the planning for the parking garages. And I guess what I want to know, Homer, is you said the park use won't change, and I'm curious how will the park use not change? You can't drive into the park, you, you can't, you're going to have to ride a tram to use the park, you're forced to use a tram to use the park. There's only one way streets, you can't park on the streets. There are turnarounds like when you come into Redbud that you can't drive back, you can't go on into the park. You're closing roads to cars, you're closing Avenue A at the Woodlawn Crossing. Well, that will very much change how people use the park. I don't understand your repeated comment that park use won't change. I say you need to start over and you need to involve the real park users, the citizens that own the park. Thank you. And as for me, I love to drive through the park. I know people who read the paper in the park with their coffee every morning. And if you try to stop the people that own the park, and if you decide to stop me from driving through my park, you are going to open yourself a can of whoop-ass. Thank you. Susanna Segura, followed by Jean Elder. I'm Susana, um, I live here in District 4, and I just want the design team to raise their hands. Everybody that's in the room that's part of the design team, please raise your hands. Three people. How many people total are on the design team? Kirby Hightower? Uh, Twelve, twelve firms. Twelve firms. Twelve firms. So it's two hundred twenty-seven thousand dollars to put together a drafted Brackenridge master plan. There, there were, there was already a Brackenridge master plan, and so you, now you're making proposed changes, correct? Plans are already adopted for the nineteen seventy-five and nineteen seventy-six. That plan, by the way, just to throw out this one little piece, that plan closes more than two. For example. Okay. So I just want everybody in this room to be aware, like, who is on the design team. It's unfortunate that we've, you received the money, I guess, April through a vote by the city council, and we're just now getting community input. These are the experts right here. Everybody who's sitting around me, they're experts. They know how to use the park. I come from a working class family. My parents raised three children on what I later found out in high school was a poverty income. That was our free space. We went there. When we would go to the park, it would cost a lot of effort and 
self-restriction on our part to have enough money for all of us to go to the zoo. So then we'd park at the parking lot, we'd go into the zoo, we couldn't afford to buy drinks, we couldn't buy food, it's expensive. We would go back to the car during lunchtime and we would bust out the picnic, the ice chest, that's how it works. That's what people do. I'm opposed to closing off vehicular access. I'm not opposed to one-way vehicular access to the park, but people need to be able to park wherever they want to be. I'm mobility impaired. I recently went on a neighborhood tour and I had to crawl into the van. That's embarrassing. You have to take that into account. People don't want to ride trams if they don't have to. If they can get themselves around, they will. I don't bring my walker, I don't bring my walking stick, I don't bring my wheelchair, because it's embarrassing for me. I'm newly mobility impaired. It's a year and a half. I'm still dealing with it. But you have to understand that people use the park. And this is how they use the park. I would hate to see parking garages go up around the perimeter of the park that will then destroy the view shed of the park. That would be horrible. I, would, I wouldn't want people to have to pay more money just to use an amenity that's already free. That doesn't make any sense to me. Thank you. Gene Elder followed by Mark Sullivan. Yes, hi, I'm Gene Elder and I uh, live in the River Road area and I do observe the park on a daily basis. I go there and I drive through there and I see exactly what's going on. And uh, the entrance that you're proposing at the zoo, uh, I, you have not included the fact that that is a two-lane path that goes up around to the Alamo Stadium in Trinity University, which when they have activities at the Laurie Auditorium or the football stadium, it is an impacted situation to the point of being dangerous uh, because the traffic does not move. So to make the entrance to the zoo is not taking into consideration that that's making the situation worse. Uh, the way it is now, it seems to be fine. There doesn't seem to be a problem getting to the zoo. And of course, then you're talking about, uh, you, you know, the park is talking out of both sides of your mouth about these road situations. You say you're not going to do anything, but all you do is talk about how you're going to change it. And the Hildebrand entrance and exit would just make the situation even worse because people that are coming to go to the uh, uh, baseball diamond or just come into that part of the park, that is a very convenient way to do that. We're used to it, so why change it? And then if you're going to close it, then you're, making your, you're saying that we need to go over to the zoo to get into the park and wind all the way around to the other side and then you can't get out so you have to come all the way back around to get out and then on the Red Oak Street which is the street that goes into Mulberry this is how Mulberry between St. Mary's and Broadway is a two-lane path and sometimes it's very convenient to be able to get out of those traffic jams by going into the park and you're saying that you want to make a little roundabout at the end of the street. So in other words, you're saying you want to make a dead end. Is that correct? Yes, the idea is the turnaround's mid-block. And so what's the point of that? Why would you want to make a, a roundabout at the end of the street so that you can't get anywhere? And you know, the other thing is that I have to keep pointing up at the other two meetings that I've come to is that when you screw up the roads into the park, this becomes a dangerous situation if there's any kind of emergency. You can't get a police car in there or an ambulance because you've got a roundabout at the end of the street where they, so then they have to go all the way back around and come in, you know, to later or, or of course they can't come in Hildebrand and get to the emergency because you've closed that off. They have to go into the zoo. So you're screwing up the streets and we keep telling you not to do that and you're not listening. Thank you. Mark Sullivan, followed by Rebecca Alvarez.
Thank you all for being here um, and taking your time out to be here. Um, appreciate it. Um, because we all do recognize this is an important issue. Our parks are very important to us all. Plato said, if you're not active politically, you risk being governed by those less intelligent than you. So, uh, so I grew up in San Antonio, and I know Brackenridge Park very well. I swam at the boathouse at Lambert Beach. I have enjoyed it as a child with my grandparents, with my parents, myself and my wife, my children, and now my grandchildren. That's five generations of my family have enjoyed this park. I know this park very well. I have attended every meeting that the Parks and Recreation Department has put on regarding this uh, Brackenridge Park Master Plan. And nobody likes this plan. <laughs> Sorry, Homer. Nobody likes this plan. I think uh, it's, it's uh, one of those things where uh, people say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So uh, now I'm older and a little wiser and I've seen many things in my day and I can see that this is a, this is a poorly designed plan with many defects and it appears to be drafted by developers for the benefit of the developers and not for the benefit of the owners of the park. And that's all of us. It's you too. We're the owners of that park. Um, we own our parks, the citizens of San Antonio. And uh, we recently lost the headwaters of the Acequia Madre was covered over in Brackenridge Park. Uh, did you know about this? We lost the headwaters of the very Acequia Madre. And then you're talking about making this a, a, a protected site. Um, and then we lost the historic alligator gardens. Where did that go? Um, it's paved over. Um, so Brackenridge Park was dedicated as a public park for the people forever, just like Hemisphere Park is. So I humbly request that you, one, throw out this plan and start over. Two, do not ignore us and try to submit this plan to city council. Three, do not ask us for any more money in this next bond until you can show us that you can be responsible stewards of our parklands and protect our parks and keep greedy developers out of our parks. Yes. So, thank you. I'm almost finished. Just another, okay. So, on that note, please get our Hemisphere Park back. Yes. It is your job to protect our parks. Now you're letting these developers build 430 apartments on our park and two hotels in our park. Does that change the park use? Um, is this how you protect our parks? How can we trust you with our parks? You lost Hemisphere, now get our Hemisphere Park back and don't ask us for any more money until you first get those developers out of our Hemisphere Park and you preserve and protect our cultural resources. Thank you, Mr. Sullivan. You. Next up, Rebecca D. Alvarez, followed by Maria Davila Salinas. So first Thank thing you. I want to say is that Brackenridge Park doesn't belong to the city of San Antonio. It belongs to the residents of San Antonio. And basically, what I want to say is that I'm very leery of a master plan. This is the first meeting I have come to. I've heard very little about it on the news and media. 
Uh, I was handed a flyer when my husband and I were coming out of the Witty Museum a few weeks ago, and my first reaction was, they're gonna mess it up. I just, I just had that feeling, and after seeing uh, your plan here, I do, I do believe I was correct in that. Um, so I'm, I'm very leery of a master plan that will significantly change our Brackenridge, our beloved Brackenridge Park. I believe some of the plans are, uh, some of the plans are improvements that will modernize the park, but I believe the parking changes and the, and the road changes are what trouble me the most. And I believe this is also gentrifying Brackenridge Park, as you all have done to some of the neighborhoods. And that will push out most of the San Antonians that grew up using this park. And, that, and I think you all are aiming it more for the middle class, the tourists that are, that are coming in, and you're taking it, the use away of that park from our own people, blocking our people out of the park. And these so-called plans that you say are, quote, not set in stone, I think sometimes when you see plans like this already drawn up, I think they are, and you're just trying to make us feel better by pretending to listen to us. See? That's what I'm saying. By pretending to listen to us. So history tells me that you're going to do what you want to do anyway, and it's going to leave people out of our park. And remember, you just added parking spaces and picnic areas and walkways to the park that I see people using. And so what if there are a lot of folks there on Sunday? Those are San Antonians. They have the right to be there. They bring their cars. My husband and I don't, we've only been there a couple of times. Um, but we do use the park. We, I have a, we have a membership at the Witty. We have a membership at the zoo. We walk the trails. And we enjoy the park. But when I saw this plan that y'all are going to change the roads and add parking garages and trams and things like that, I said, I can go to Disney World to do that. OK? But, um, I, and if you want to really um, uh, remove impervious cover, try removing it from the aquifer. That is where we need to have more green spaces. Thank you. Thank you, Maria Davalos Salinas, followed by Cynthia Brain. So my name is Maria Davalo Salinas. I'm the president of the Mission Democrats of Bear County, so I believe I should get my nine minutes. So let me first start off by saying that, you know, I, I came to this meeting and one of the first things that you say is that this is the sixth meeting and you make it sound so pretty and so good that Parks and Rec and City Council decided we're gonna open this up to the community which is a tro total falsehood. Because you had two meetings with residents around the park, and then someone found out, and community activists, Maria, Barrio <laughs> Esperanza, Fuerza Unida, you had, start you had people that started getting basically on your butts saying, we deserve to have community meetings. Yes. So to stand up here, and I feel like I'm talking to city council because I've seen your reactions to most people talking, and you're here because you have to be here. Not because you feel that this is the right thing to do. Not, not because, because you feel that the people have a right to speak, but because it's your duty and it's your job to be. Well, you know what? It's our duty as citizens to be here, to speak up on behalf of all the people that never heard about this meeting. The problem with city council, the problem with parks and recreation, is that, what did you all do to notify all the people? There's hundreds of people around this area. My mother-in-law lives down the street. She never heard about this meeting. There was nothing done. It was community activists that flyered. It was my organization that sent out hundreds of emails and put it on Facebook and paid to put it on Facebook so that people would find out. But the people that truly use the park, earlier you said, well, we want to make it useful for the residents around there. Most residents around there probably have never stepped foot in that park. It's the poor people. It's the people that live on the south side, the west side, and the east side. 
The people that have no place else to go, but to take their kids on a Sunday and drive to the park. I asked you earlier about pain. You said no. You know what? The city lies. Everything that comes out of your mouth, eventually what we all will say, well, it was a private company that, that built the parking garage, so they have every right to charge. Or the tram, they're privately owned, so if they want to charge a fee, that's up to them. So the city washes its hands, as it usually does, and and we're supposed to say, oh, yeah, well, you have a good point there. <laughs> well, I think that everyone here, what everyone here is saying, is that we demand that you listen to us. Because I'm speaking for hundreds of people, thousands of people, that have no idea what you're going to do. That have no idea about this time. And that you have made no effort to contact those people. The papers made an effort. The papers putting out, Express News putting out articles. The community activists are putting out articles. Susan Zagura has not stopped. I applaud you for that. Maria perez -Ovo, everyone here has not stopped. But you all stopped. You all stopped when you spent the money to have this done and now think, okay, well, let me make this cute little presentation, and then, yeah, I'll listen, but I'm not really even going to look at the speaker like you're not looking at me right now. But, because really, what are you here for? You're not really here to hear the people. So a couple of my other questions would be, you say that there's going to be access to the park, but yet here you say regular days, restricted vehicle use, multi-use path only. Okay, our people are used to driving into the park. The south side people, the west side people, the east side people, we're used to driving in there. We're used to being able to park wherever we want, have a picnic. Sometimes I don't have money, but I take my granddaughters down there and they feed the ducks. A lot of people do that. A lot of people don't have what other people have. And so what you're taking away is from the people, the poor of our city. Again, it's gentrification, just like Mission Trails was. It's, it's always comes back to gentrification. It's for the best. Okay, you want to bring tourists in. How many, okay, so a tourist comes in once. How about the family that goes out there five times? How about the Hundreds of families that have for generations gone on Easter Sunday and spent their Easter's there. What, at some point, because you don't really know what's going to happen, is there going to be fees charged to those families? Or are there, it says here that there, you can drive in to drop off. Okay, so are you going to hire more park police to make sure that that's happening and that the flow's going through? Has any of that, I don't see anything. I haven't heard you talk about any of that. What's it going to cost? What more is it going to cost us? This needs to be taken back to the beginning. And it needs to be, you need to spend another $275,000 on questionnaires and going to city neighborhoods, not to developers, to ask their opinion as to what should be done and how the park should be extended. Thank you. Cynthia Brain, followed by Maria Periosapo. Hello, everyone. My name is Cynthia Brown, and I am a student at St. Mary's University. I'm, I'm embarking on my second career. One of the things that we're studying right now is conflict resolution. And one of the things that I recommend that this panel does is a book that I'm currently reading, and that is called Managing Public Disputes. Please write that down. Because what that means is they take the entire community, special interest groups, civic groups, activists, they take residents from the neighborhood, they take the developers, they take the city, they take everybody 
within the entire fabric of the community. They bring them together and they select certain people to be representative, like Miss uh, Maria Davala, to be representative of her group. And she speaks for those people. And then they put these panels across the board and everybody writes down what's important to them. And then they come up with a plan. A plan that is totally representative of the people. Our government is of the people, for the people, and by the people, not representative of one person that created a plan to fit the people. That is what we need. We need to have a consensus, and like everyone has repeatedly said here today, we need to start over. You need to do this for the people. So that's why I'm here, is to make this known to you. You need to start over and do it right instead of wasting our money and putting one man's vision to accommodate a whole bunch of people, and it just doesn't work. Thank you, Ms. Lynn. Our new member of Congress, followed by Edward Wadden. First of all, uh, you were not in the Guadalupe. Uh, another gentleman from Parks and Recreation was there, so I'll repeat what I said then. It's very awkward uh, to be speaking to you because I know you're not the one that got up one day and said you were going to you know, change Brackenridge Park, uh, but you're the one they sent. Uh, and, uh, and that itself is awkward because I, I still don't know who we're talking to and, and who all these comments are going to go to. Uh, I was told that they are for the, for the team, for the architects. And it would have been very good if from the beginning all the architects and all the people who put that plan together would have been in front so we could talk to them and ask them the questions. And this lady said a lot of what I was going to say about process. Uh, and that's what I'll address again, and that's process. Uh, as has been uh, indicated already, the reason these uh, meetings were held is because some of us asked for them. And I don't know if Councilman Trevino is still here. Thank you. I, I appreciate that he has, uh, that he came and that he has, you know, stayed with us. Uh, so he and the, the park staff facilitated having the meetings, and, and that's good. However, uh, I, have, I went to one meeting, I attended this one, I watched the videos of the others, and I got reports of the ones that are not recorded. And there is overwhelming opposition to certain parts of this plan. Uh, there are feelings that certain groups of people are being let down. Uh, and it's messy because what should have been done at the beginning, which is listen to the people, is being done now. So that's why people are frustrated and people, you know, have been left out and that's terrible. So I think, uh, in fairness, uh, again, I don't know what's going to be done with the, uh, with the input of the people. Uh, God bless Nowcast because at least it's recorded, but I don't think the city officially recorded anything. Uh, and, who can, and we want the city council to hear all this. So what I read in the last page of the master plan that perhaps is still online, it could have been taken off, was that um, there, the plan would be taken to city council, to the planning department in, uh, in June. And then the city council would vote on it in August. I think that absolutely should not be done because that would mean that all of these comments that all these people had that uh, have um, uh, brought out some issues that had not been discussed before, we want the answers to all those questions and responses to all those comments. Uh, this has to be, uh, the deadline has to be moved, I think indefinitely. Uh, I hope that nothing related to parking garages or Brackenridge Park is included in any bond issue because you'll take the whole bond issue down. Uh, and that this uh, work needs to be scratched and start all over again. And I feel bad because that's an investment of uh, almost a fourth of a million dollars. Uh, that went to these architects. Uh, so right now, my suggestion, request, is to just stop. Uh, listen to what the people said. Start all over again and do justice to the people who are using Brackenridge Park now and have been using it for generations. 
and it's people who don't have backyards and don't have parks next to them. And it's uh, close with a testimony that has already been mentioned uh, of a lady that went to the Guadalupe. She said she was a single mom, had several children. She drove through the park to entertain her children when she could. And if she could spare $20, she bought them some chicken for a picnic. Those are the users of the park. And to address some of your points, all of the comments that have been collected throughout the uh, six meetings will be collated by the project team as we look at refining based on public input the plan. And we actually, um, yes, now CAS has been present at, at several of the meetings, and we also have a videographer here as well. So the city is also reporting that as well. So we've got a couple of, of locations or a couple of entities that are doing that. But uh, thank you for your comments. Uh, next up is Edward Juarez, followed by Olga. K. Last name begins with a K. I'm sorry, I can't read it. Thank you. Ed Juarez, is Ed still here? No. Okay, so next up is uh, Olga. Followed by, thank you, followed by Monica Cruz. Thank you. Uh, I am not a native San Antonian. I didn't come to San Antonio until I was at St. Mary's University. I was a student. And I grew up in the Rio Grande Valley where we have no parks. We might have a little little placita somewhere, but that's about it. So uh, if we wanted to play in, in the green, green, beautiful nature, we would have to go play in the cotton field or the corn field, so, which was no fun. So when I got to San Antonio, uh, a bunch of my friends that lived here took me to Breckenridge Park and I thought it was, I thought I had died and gone to heaven. There was greenery, there was water, it was beautiful and it was free and we could park anywhere we wanted and walk anywhere we wanted and, and I fell in love with it. We went to Sunken Gardens, we went to the zoo and it was very affordable for a really poor college student. Uh, when I, uh, Grew up and got married and had kids. My kids had the privilege of going to, to Brackenridge Park. And they're, they're only 14 months apart, so it's like having twins. And if you ever had to schlep two, two toddlers to the park, you know how much stuff you have to carry. You know, two strollers, two diaper bags, you know, a bunch of meals, a lot of food. And we didn't have to worry about that because we just put everything in the car, we'd park and just take everything out. We didn't have to worry about taking a tram or finding a parking garage. We could just go. And it became a family weekend tradition. They learned to ride horses there. They did all these things. And I would hate to think that all of that is going to go away. And that my grandchildren will be able to enjoy that and have the privilege of, of growing up in Brackenridge Park. So I think that some of these plans, if you had asked any families like, like like me or anyone in this room, they would have said, no, we don't want the roads closed. We don't want a parking garage. We don't want trams, you know. You can't take two toddlers and all that, all that stuff and schlep them in a tram and get to where you want to go. Grandmother can, can't walk all the way to the tram and get on the tram and get off the tram. So I think some of this are not designed for the people that today use the park. And we need to continue that. This park belongs to the people. In 1899, this park was founded on land that was deeded to the city by George Brackenridge. And the park was meant to be used by all San Antonians, well, except Mexicans. I think there was a deed in there. No, I'll call them no Mexicans. So we still get to use the park anyway. But I think that some of these new changes are really going to keep up some of the poorest. And and most grateful families that, that love Rugged Ridge Park and consider part of their family tradition. So I would advise 
the committee or whoever is in charge of this to start over and please make sure that you get community input if you want to make any changes in the park. Thank you. Hello, good evening. Um, I'm here also just to publicly state my concerns regarding the plans for the park. Um, all the points that have been made prior regarding accessibility, I too am concerned about. I think we certainly have to think about the multi-generational use of families that use the park. When we think of having individuals park in a parking garage and take a tram and all that, I think we are neglecting to really take into consideration the beauty of many of our intergenerational families that are big families. And so you will go through, as many of us, go through Breckenridge and you'll see the beauty of familias getting together on a Sunday afternoon and you have tios and tias and primos and abuelos and you take two or three cars to get your familia down there and you try and go early so that you can all park together. And when you think about a picnic out there, we don't, you know, our familias, we're not like, you know, cheese and crackers and fruit kind of things. We bring our fajitas with coolers and our pollo and we bring our potato salad and that's a lot of food to haul oftentimes. So we really, you know, I guess I'm here to ask for, for all of those that are part of this process right now to really open your doors, open your minds. Let, let San Antonio be a city that exemplifies inclusivity and not exclusivity when you think about when we think about public policy, when we think about decision making. To set an example for other cities around the country, with all that we're hearing these days, with the divisity that's happening and, and the, the pain that's happening in many of our communities, let us be an example where we think and we ask ourselves who's sitting at the table but who is not sitting at the table. Obviously, you have many hearings already, and you have, I think, very uh, you know key individuals that I think can offer very sound advice and thoughtfulness about the process. And so I encourage you and our you know, city officials to consider bringing those individuals to the table to, to begin this process and to really rethink it and to do it well. Um, I think that's very important. I guess my last point is a quote that I often think about. When you want to do something fast, you do it alone. But when you want to do something well, we do it together. So let's try and do that. Thank you. Thank you. Donna Viera, followed by Jessica Guerrero. Hi, I'm Donna Guerra. Um, I grew up in San Antonio, and I just have a few points that I, that I want to bring up. First of all, I, I did read about, I'm concerned about the Mina Flores section of the park as well, and I did find somewhere online that there's already a master plan for that. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, and that's being carried out uh, in conversation. Have they been in conversation with this plan, or is it being done separately by a different group of, I think it's RBK doing that, the architectural group? Right, so as part of the this uh, master plan process, one of the things the project team did look at was taking into consideration the master plan that is already in place for Mita Flores, mm -hmm. but that project is separate from this one. Okay, so is the Mita Flores master plan about making it accessible to all people, or is it still going to stay this fenced off area that people can use? So in, in that master plan, um, it does look at how we can make that open and accessible to the public at that point, we're not at that point right now uh -huh. in, in doing that. Can we see that master plan? Can you put it, is it up and I didn't find it, or? I, yes, I can, I'll get your contact information, but we do have it available for public viewing, so most definitely we yeah, can get that information. Yeah, put it on your too. website, just as, you know, related in documents of interest. Okay. I'm sure everyone would like to keep sure. that. Sure, good idea, um, thank you. Okay, um, and uh, just briefly on the great run, you know, we're shade seekers here in San Antonio, and um, I've, I've enjoyed the great run in Central Park many times, but um, that climate and the range of temperatures makes it exciting and inviting to go out to a great lawn 
here, I would just run, you know, like, get me out of that space. I need a tree. I need some shade. So it really doesn't work for our area. It's not San Antonio um, relevant, I think. Um, I just want to say that um, I agree with a lot of the people that have spoken here about, you know, behind, and I think the creative team, you know, certainly is creative, but we're here having all of these, all of this dynamic conversation because as public servants, you all, you know, you work for us, and um, this process has been, you know, best backwards, as you think you will. And so we wouldn't be here if the process had originally included us, the people you work for. Um, and so just a hope, I, I don't know if people have said it, I hope it's a learning moment for our public government. I, I hope something good comes out of this, but it, it's very distressing that we have to even be here and that it was conducted that way. Um, you know, I think part of what I perceive is or I think I've heard it said that, you know, this whole Broadway corridor development, um, people, you know, I know families that can't afford the $12 per person entry fee of the museum, right? Everything along the way, I can because, you know, I'm lower middle class. I can go there once in a while. I can use the Pearl. I can use all the fancy places once in a while. I can't do it a lot because it'll break my back. But, um, so the idea, it seems like that this park is being brought into the Broadway corridor, and I just think that's wrong. This has been a people's park, this has been a community park. I mean, in the widest sense, San Antonio, all over, not just the west side, not just the east side. You know, north side people use the park. Um, what will be taken away, I, I really haven't found a problem with cars in the park. I think um, keeping the cars driving the park is, would be a, I want that to remain. Um, I have, you know, family photos, I'm sure you all do too. We have Super 8 films that show us, you know, having fun in the park, his birthday parties, whatnot. I, I don't, I was thinking, gosh, do I have to start a website that's, you know, the history of the Dragon Ridge Park, the People's Park? Don't let us do that. We don't want to memorialize it, we want it to stay current. We want it to con continue to be a People's Park. Um, and the Broadway corridor rising of it will be a huge mistake. Um, and, uh, let's see, I'm sorry I'm taking a little bit long, but uh, I can't read my own scribble. So my own current uh, use of the park is that I work at a hard work, and so um, when I need to get out of the office, you know, I'll grab my lunch and I'll drive my car to a picnic table or the banks and just sit there and enjoy my lunch and get away in this beautiful spot. And, uh, or I'll sometimes driving home, I'll say, I'm going to drive through the park because it's so pleasant. I've never had a traffic jam. I've never had an issue. I really don't think cars through the park is an issue, um, which, you know, goes to say, I think, parking garages, no, you know. So um, please keep this a people's park. It's been a San Antonio-wide park. This will change that. This will change the use of the park, the joyful spontaneity of going to the park. Thank you. Thank you. Buenas tardes, my name is Jessica Guerrero. I um, am born and raised in San Antonio in District 3, where there was no meeting house. Um, I work in the southwest side in District 4. Um, all of the south side was absolutely uh, left out of the additional meetings that came up. We all have heard already the story of how it came up. So um, I don't want to be too redundant, but I do want to reiterate uh, my concern as, as much as many people's concern around the process, right? Um, uh, Maria Dávalo Salinas brought up, you know, that we're hearing this nice story of how y'all have been so uh, complied with us, you know, to add these meetings. Yes, you added them, you should have had them in the first place. Once you added them, you still left a really huge part of the city out. So there is much work to be done around this process. Um, it is not only the Department of Parks and Recreation, we know that this is unfortunately uh, part of a much larger, much deeper, much nastier culture within our city government of excluding communities uh, most impacted by the decisions that are being made. I would like to 
to know specifically what happens next, right? So you gave us the meetings, you're taking your notes, you brought a camera out to the last meeting, now Cass, you know, picked up the slack for you and the meeting before that. What happens next? How do we know that our ideas, our suggestions, our questions, um, how are those being addressed? Where is the follow-up? So as far as next steps, all of the meetings that have been uh, occurred to date, comments, whether they've been email, public comments by Citizens Sign Up to Speak, the support uh, based on the, the vision boards in the back, all of that is going to be collated by the project team and uh, we will provide and make that information available to the public. Next step will be for the Parks and Recreation Department to update the Neighborhoods and Livability Committee, which is chaired by Councilman Trevino. And so that will be the next step in the process, was to make sure they have an understanding of where we're at in the process and then develop further steps from that point forward. But everything that's uh, been made available to the project team through input from the public, that information will be shared. Thank you. And I appreciate sort of getting a little bit of a dialogue in this, in, in this setting, which we don't see in a lot of other um, community meetings. So thank you for that. But <laughs> we still need much more dialogue and exchange through that. And um, I'm going to ask, when you say that it will be made available to the public house, do you know how? Yes. Yeah, so um, for example, we have comment cards in the back that uh, we're going to be scanning and uploading to our website, because that's been some of the things that citizens, citizens have asked is, you know, what about the information? How are we going to see that? So we'll be uploading those directly. It's not going to reflect a tabulation of anything. It's going to be exactly as written. That will be uploaded to the Parks and Recreation website. We do have a dedicated web, a dedicated web page for uh, the Brackenridge Park Master Plan. In addition, we uh, uploaded the last public meeting that was um, recorded and we'll be doing so again with this one. So all of those comments that come in, we'll be providing that information on our website. That's one way. After uh, we do the update to Neighborhoods and Livability, we um, are, are looking at how we can also report out to the community, possibly in another setting like this, getting back out saying, here's, you know, here's what I guess occurred today, here's what came out of the Neighborhoods and Livability Committee meeting, and then share that information with the public. What's the name of the website so we can write it down, please? Yes, you ask asking the name of the website? Yes, yeah, so if you go to um, our the Parks and Recreation website, we have a banner that's scrolling. Sa so, uh, San Antonio Parks and Recreation gov, and then on that website, or on that front page, you've got the scroller, and it's front and center, that the Brackenridge Park master plan process, and it includes these vision boards that we have here this evening, it includes the video that we uploaded from last week, it will include the public comment cards as well, those items that we talked about uploading, and you'll find it on our, our webpage if you click on that banner. Yes, ma'am. .gov slash parks and rec, R-E-C, and there's no spaces in that. So www.sanantonio.gov slash parks and rec, and on the front page you'll see the Brecken Ridge Master Plan. A-N-D. A-N-D. P-A-R-K-S-A-N-D-R-E-C. Thank you, Lynn, for the clarification. Thank you for that. And yes. if I could just um, suggest also or, or um, make sure that you know that many organizations, community groups are represented here, and I'm sure it's been represented throughout um, uh, the meetings that you've had. Um, I would suggest um, contacting them as well to see if we can help facilitate the information because not all of our community members can get to a computer um, or look it up on their phone. That gets really complicated even if they do have online service on their phone. Um, so maybe we can start to work a little bit better together with uh, those groups that can help you connect to the city. Uh, I'm sorry, to the community. <laughs> uh, Thank you. And I know my uh, time is running out, but you took some of it and I appreciate it. So let me just add one more thing real quick. Um, <laughs> and I belong to a few groups I could take about 90 minutes. 
but I won't. Um, no, I just wanted to say really quick that we, um, a few of us did do some firing at Rackenridge Park, also at Woodlawn Park, and people were very, very afraid that some of the things that they see happening at Brackenridge Park, at Hemisphere, you know, might soon come to Woodlawn. We were talking to people that had, part, that had a camp there overnight, um, people that were coming in from out of town that had camp there overnight. You know, again, it's an affordable option for people. And um, we also did a small mail out. The Mujeres Machera group, the uh, group that organizes the Women's Day March. And um, everybody that we've talked to is absolutely, again, just to reiterate a lot of what people said, um, do not want to pay in any way for any type of use of Brackenridge Park. And just one more concern that I wanted to ask about is what, can, can you tell us more please about what you're referring to around the quality of the water um, in terms of the paddle boat rides and in terms of any other concerns around water quality. And also if, um, if I could just ask you to start thinking now about what that process is going to be for how you tell the story of uh, the history of water because I saw that in the plan and um, I hope that you really do take to heart that the processes that the city uses are not efficient, are not adequate, the water story is our story and we need to be a part of it. Thank you. There may have been a question buried in there, and I, I missed it. Is it about the water quality, what yes. that means? Yes. So the example I use is uh, on the east side of the park is the Catalpa Pershing, which is um, you know man-made channel. So by restoring that to, you know, which basically conveys the water, all the runoff from the streets into the river and then on down. So by restoring that to a, a natural setting, it allows the water to be clean, filtered, maybe through a rain garden, and before it ends up in the river. So that's one example of how looking at preserving those cultural or historic assets within the park, we can do that in a way that um, improves the water quality, but allows it to retain its functionality for conveying water during periods of, of heavy rain. Yeah, of course, it's non-functional. It is not carrying any flood water from the San Antonio River. It's been blocked and it's totally unaffected. I have no problem with you wanting to make it look nicer, but don't kid yourself about what it's doing. So I would just add that to the many reasons for why this time needs to be paused. There are many issues of, you know, water contamination concerns throughout the city, and um, I think we would all love to take a closer look at what that means uh, within this time. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I'd like to say that I'm looking online right this minute at sanantonio.gov forward slash parks and rec, and there's not a darn thing in there about Rich Park process, not us. So where do we go? It, it, there's a banner scrolling at top, so I'm going to ask Liz to... Why don't you tell the audience, everybody would like to know how to find what he just got through saying, and she just got through saying, where it is. It's not there. Is it the mobile display? I, I think it may be just yeah. the mobile display, the way it's coming up on yeah. the website. So you have to look at it on a computer or an iPad. It's not mobile friendly. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I can look into it. And see. Did you get it? Did somebody else get it? She got it on her, so maybe it's my Maybe it's the way it's displayed. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, thank you. Monica Ariaga. Hello, everyone. My name is Monica Ariaga, and I would just like to start out by um, conveying my concerns as well and echo the sentiments uh, of concerns over this process being ministerial in nature and that even though you are taking strides to put a report together with comments and um, videography uh, to memorialize everything that's being said, how do we know that city council is going to take any of that into consideration and I would also like to know, um, will City Council be in any way held accountable to actually watch and read any reports and video uh, history on the comments of the citizens of San Antonio? So uh, with regards to, I guess, the sincerity or 
listening to all the comments that have been collected. Um, you know, when I started, I kind of pointed out that through the civic engagement and, and leadership of uh, Maria Bedio Sabo, identifying the need and, and lack of additional public input in this process, reached out to Councilman um, Rabino, and through his leadership, he did engage his colleagues. And um, even this evening, uh, Councilman Saldana walked in midstream. So uh, we, they're here, they're listening, and they know that our charge is to come back and share with them exactly what has transpired, what is the public sentiment regarding these strategies. And we're going to do that at the Neighborhoods and Livability Committee, Committee meeting in August. And that's an opportunity for direct dialogue with uh, the, the council subcommittee regarding the public comments, the inputs, and where we go next. So their, their uh, Councilman Tavino's leadership in engaging his colleagues to help deliver these meetings in quadrants across the city is, is a reflection of their commitment to the process and, and Park's response to, to stepping up and meeting that challenge and, and sharing that commitment. Thank you. I also have a follow-up question regarding your livability committee. Um, you just mentioned that it's a city council subcommittee uh, that will be in attendance of that particular meeting. Is that what I understood you to say? The last part that, so... A city council subcommittee uh -huh. that will be in attendance at the livability committee meeting? So, okay, so the... Um, our community meeting? Yeah, the, the Neighborhoods Livability Committee is a council subcommittee. Okay. And so typically the process is we provide a briefing, an update, and then from that point forward, receive direction before it comes back to the full council. And where is the information derived that's going to be shared or discussed at this livability committee meeting? So the information is derived from the uh, public comments from each of the meetings. It's derived from the comment cards that we'll be uploading. It's derived from uh, the, the boards in the back, which are larger version of what you have in your hand. There's a scale at the bottom from that from each meeting. We've been tracking the uh, level of support through the placement of dots. So that will be tabulated. And all of that will, I mean, the, the, the update will reflect all of that information. So in multiple forms, we have surveys. Um, uh, in, on iPads in the back that allow citizens a different way if they know specifically you know, what they feel and maybe don't need the one-on-one uh, -on -one questions by, by the stations. So all of that information is where, or all of those forms is how we're getting that information back. And then even on the, the website that Ms. Moore was asking about, there's a, a email address dedicated to comments for this Brackenridge Park Master Plan. So those email comments as well will be part of that process. I would also like to state that uh, as a mother of a handicapped child who was wheelchair bound his entire life, uh, I am very aware of access for that particular part of our community. And it seems to me that the way the form of the park right now and the ability of those uh, to drive through the park parking spaces that are close to picnic areas and picnic tables uh, are very accessible to wheelchair bound or mobility challenged people. And my concern is that if we have trams and if we have any kind of uh, van access, where are these people going to be dropped off? How far are they going to be expected to get to a, a, a picnicking area, if you will? I was just in the park about two or three days ago driving through as I believe one of our other citizens mentioned that she does sometimes during lunch or after work. And I noticed that there was a young lady in a wheelchair who had just arrived to the park. She was able to park in a slot that was maybe 20 to 50 feet away from a picnicking area with her family and they began to have a celebration which I thought was a very beautiful thing because the way our park is now, it is very inclusive of our entire community. And I think that we need to have voices from all factions, not just socioeconomic uh, areas, but also those, those citizens who have a vested interest, as we all do, in the park remaining the way it is, rather than trying to make changes uh, to areas, if you will, that are not broken, that don't really require fixing. 
And to not take in and account for the opinions of us as citizens, to me, is very disturbing. And if the Livability Committee meeting is going to take place in August, how far in advance of the actual uh, city council vote will that be that is going to occur in August? So there, there's no uh, council vote that occurs in August. The purpose of the Neighborhood and Livability Committee meeting will be simply to update them on the public comment and where we're at thus far. At that point, we will take direction mm -hmm. from the Livability Committee, and you know it's likely going to be that we need to still need to report out to the public and refine, based on all of the feedback from the, the multiple meetings, refine the strategies. Maybe you know some are move forward, maybe some don't, but that's going to be before there's any type of council vote by the council to adopt the master plan. That is still quite a way down. To down the road. No date has been set yet for that to happen, just to update the livability community in August and then receive further direction at that point while we work to refine the, the master plan. Thank you very much. Uh, I just thing. also want to add that I'm also a member of Mission Democrats of Bear County and I invite anyone here and everyone here to attend our meet and greet, which will be held on July 21st at the Latuna uh, restaurant. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Albert Uresti, followed by Carolyn Atkins. My name is Albert Uresti. I'm the Bear County Tax Assessor and represent close uh, to too many people here in the county. And the reason I'm here is because you told me we're going to put a new swimming pool here for the park. Is that right? No. <laughs> anyway, the, uh, first of all, I do want to thank all our citizens and, and all our groups that are here for being here because, you know, I know you have to be home eating or doing whatever, so I commend you all for being here. And I also want to commend, you know, Councilman Trevino and Councilman Caldano for, for being here. Because I think, Ray, you're a newlywed, aren't you, Ray? Somewhat of a newlywed. So Ray's here and Councilman Trevino and, of course, our... Assistant City Manager, Ms. Dia Gomez, thank you for being here. Uh, I will add that the Woodlawn Park fireworks thing was great. But <clears throat> seriously, the, what, what I'm asking here is that you all, you know, when you do make a final decision, that you do take all the input that's been given not only here, but throughout the city, and that you consider it, and that you, and that you weigh everything that's been said. And uh, I'm not going to repeat everything that everybody said, but, you know, please consider it, please weigh it, and, and, and uh, you know, we have, you know, people have a lot of good ideas, and that's all I'm asking, so I just want to come by and, and let you all know that, so thank you very much. Thank you. 